My name is George Galloway, presenter of Kale Mahorra on Al Maedin Television. My name is I don't mince my words. I speak Kale Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kale Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kalimahara with me, George Galloway, coming to you from London for Al Maidin Television, but talking about China, about Iran and Saudi Arabia. It was a double shift in the tectonic plates. First of all, the agreement itself to resume diplomatic relations, to reopen embassies, exchange ambassadors, and invitations from Iran to the king of Saudi Arabia, from Saudi Arabia to the president of Iran to visit their respective capitals. This was big enough, pregnant with all kinds of consequences, both for themselves, Iran and Saudi Arabia, for minorities within each country, Shia people in the east of Saudi Arabia, the Sunni in Iran, pregnant with possibilities for the near neighbors, particularly in Yemen, war-torn, famine-stricken, uh, disease-swept, an end, a permanent end to conflict there must now be in sight. But as far away as the Levant, the implications of this historic shift are potentially discernible. Once upon a time, such an agreement as this would have been made at Camp David, would have been made on the White House lawn, but this one was made in Beijing. All roads, it would appear, now lead to Beijing, at least if you're looking to end conflicts, solve problems, rather than start them or accentuate them. A steady stream of prime ministers and presidents have been headed for Beijing even since this historic agreement. So we're looking today at what it means, what it means for the Arabs, what it means for the Muslims, and what it means for the new world order. A new world order based on a Eurasian reality where most of the wealth, most of the commodities that the world needs are, of course, located. Saudi Arabia joining the BRICS. Who would have seen that happening, especially alongside their once formidable foe in Iran? All kinds of changes are underway. And I am joined, as always, by a distinguished panel of experts. I'm merely the enthusiastic amateur. Let me introduce the first of those, Dr. Abdullah Hamouda, member of the Royal Institute for International Affairs in London, Chatham House, a writer, a broadcaster, and above all, an Egyptian. Always a pleasure to see you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you. Are you as optimistic as me at the uh, implications of this shift? Absolutely. Tell me why. Absolutely. Because it, 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 it supported an argument which I presented at Chatham House 15 years ago, at 2008, when American professor Joseph Ney came to speak uh, in promotion of his book, The American Century. And I told him... Whatever happened to the American century? Well, <laughs> that was it. I told him that America is receding willy-nilly and has to adapt to a new order to be more comprehensive, more, more uh, inclusive. Uh, and he told me that America takes that into consideration, uh, but the American way. Obviously, uh, China uh, has been uh, practicing 
politics the Chinese way. Uh, and uh, as it is called in the Western media, the reluctant superpower once, uh, it is not as reluctant anymore, but feels that it is time to present itself uh, and become more inclusive than the West and they provide an alternative world order to which even the West and America are invited on a Chinese table. I spend a fair bit of time in Beijing. The hotels are chock-a-block with visiting delegations, presidents, heads of the European Commission, prime ministers, uh, people from east, west, south and north are all heading to Beijing. What is it about their diplomacy that is proving so successful? The trade and uh, projects they presented to third world countries and mainly in Africa has proven to be uh, something to remain. And uh, they won the acceptance of the people of countries in which they worked. Uh, they did not use uh, a snobby approach or appear to be the upper hand, but we are working with you. Uh, they even sent uh, Chinese people to live there and intermarry and settle there, which was seen by some as some kind of invasion in disguise. But obviously there are so many Indians uh, in the world and there are so many Chinese, Ch Chinatown in many capitals, so why not Chinatown in an African country as well? Uh, they have presented development projects, they have taught people how to use the resources effectively and produce things to their need, not supplying them with the Coca-Cola uh, and other luxury items which they don't, they don't know about, let alone to need. Uh, yes, the Chinese had, ha, have built a base to, to, to present themselves, and they choose the time uh, because of something relates to their own. Uh, they thought if they challenge America, while America is bogged down in the Ukraine, uh, that will be a good time. Uh, and also a second point is that if America and the NATO win in the Ukraine against Russia, that may be uh, some kind of rehearsal for a similar act in Taiwan. Indeed so. Uh, broadcasting legend Huda al-Rashid, the first woman ever to present a news broadcast on Saudi television, a familiar voice Thank on you. the BBC World Service for decades. I won't say how many decades, but decades. Thank you. Uh, what was it about this moment that persuaded the leadership in Saudi Arabia to make this deal. Can I remind the world and everybody that in 1929, there was a friendship agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And we tend to forget that the two nations, they believe in one religion. Shia and Sunnah, you said, As, uh, it doesn't matter that the religion is one, Islam. They read one book. Quran. They uh, fast one month, Ramadan, maybe two days before, two days after. It doesn't matter because on pilgrimage, they all have to go in one day and do the whatever they have to do, same one day. And I think both countries are um, major power in, they have oil, they have gas, both the same level. So I was wondering why, why not before, why now? Of course, there, there are some reasons why now, but um, I think it's... Is it the crown prince? He gets a bad press, including from me. But when you look at the achievements of the crown prince, MBS, uh, you'd have to say that he's made life better, particularly for women in Saudi Arabia and he has shifted Saudi foreign policy in a very positive way, wouldn't you? 
also I want to remind you about something. There was a letter sent to either King Khalid of Saudi Arabia or King Fahd, I can't remember, from the Shah of Iran. He said, open, open the country, let the ladies uh, wear uh, many, many jobs. And uh, the, 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 the king answered him, you are not in Paris or, or, or the Champs Elysees, you are in an Islamic country and the ladies cannot wear many jobs. Anyhow, we are open up now. Saudi Arabia is open up, which is a good thing. We are not wearing many jobs, but we are driving. We are working everywhere. You, if you go to a Saudi uh, airport, all the ladies are around you. They are serving you. It's, uh, it's, and we are driving, of course. Very important indeed, yes. uh, and driving well. Uh, Robert Carter, uh, investigative journalist and researcher, you report on Press TV, Iranian State TV. You can't speak for Iran, but let me ask you the mirror uh, image question that I asked uh, Huda, Madame Huda. Uh, why this time for Iran to make this agreement? Well, to be honest with you, um, let's take a look at who's been trying to make some kind of deal work in the past. It's been America with several talks that have taken place in Iraq. I think there was at least five of those that have taken place over the past couple of years. And they've achieved bubkus. And I think that by and large, one of the main reasons for that is because America does not have a working relationship with many of the countries of the region, Iran being a prominent example of that. They just do not have any relationship with Iran whatsoever to their own cost. They haven't been able to make any progress in that sense. China, on the other hand, builds working relationships with all sides and has a, a policy of neutrality by and large, particularly when it looks at regions like the Middle East. So they're willing to work with the Saudis, they're willing to work with the Iranians as well, as well as everyone else. And by surprise, surprise, it's the Chinese that have come out with this shock deal that have actually been able to find a way to please both the Iranians and the Saudis. And that's something which America would never have been able to achieve now or before, because the fact of the matter is America sees the region as property which it needs to dominate. And that's a policy which they've been enacting on for decades now. And it's reached a stage where I think Saudi Arabia and Iran, who uh, they are, they are, they see each other as enemies. Let's be, let's get real here. They see each other as regional enemies fighting for control of that area of their territory. And I think now that even the Saudis are looking at their historical ally, the United States, and are saying these guys can't sort us out. They are not making any progress for what we want in the region. And actually, Saudi Arabia is in a very awkward position where on the two wings of the Arab world, Iraq and Yemen, they're, then they're not achieving their uh, geopolitical uh, and uh, uh, objectives at all. So I think now we've reached a position where Iran and Saudi Arabia see how bad the region has become. It's their region. They need to see some kind of progress made. They can't leave it the way it is, and it's actually getting worse. So they've decided, the, well, if America's not going to fix it for us in the West, they're going to look east, and that's exactly what's happened. So I think the biggest losers here, without a doubt, is Washington and also Israel. Perhaps we'll talk about that in a bit. We will, for sure. Let's talk uh, first, though, to Carl Ja, who is Chinese ethnically, but lives in Indonesia and is speaking to us from Japan. We certainly get around here on Kalimahora. Carl, welcome. Thank you. In the recent past, even, China was concentrating on economic matters, on trade matters, uh, albeit through its Belt and Road Initiative, through infrastructural investment in all kinds of uh, countries and indeed continents. But it was very much a reluctant superpower when it came to big power politics. What has changed? What has propelled them into the front line of deal makers? And you couldn't get a much bigger deal than the one between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, um, China has long pursued what's called the non-interference policy uh, abroad. And so it's to everyone's surprise, this, this time China broke a major peace deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And this uh, peace deal have, would have significant impact on the Middle East because as we know, um, there has been a long running conflict and it, it's by, by China inserting itself in, into the Middle East peace process, um, what I see is uh, 
China is paving the way to play ever more important role in the Middle Eastern politics. Can we expect now China to be more prominent in other parts of Middle East political problems, other conflicts, other issues? Um, I, I, I think you will. China will be more present in the Middle Eastern politics more than ever before. Um, previously, China have adopted a rather low profile uh, a, a diplomatic approach where it emphasized on bilateral relations, country to country relations. So China, for example, will have uh, a conversation with Iran, but also have a conversation with Saudi Arabia. But much of the negotiation is kept under wraps. Um, it's not di disclosed to the public. Uh, by taking a very public stance, by um, acting as a broker of this peace deal, China is showing its willingness to get involved in the Middle East. Uh, that's something we haven't seen before. The deal brokered in Beijing between Tehran and Riyadh is obviously the high point of their political role as a frontline superpower in international relations. Do you think that this is the beginning of something important, that it will be followed by other Chinese interventions in other issues? Yes, yes. What, what, what we have seen is China is pursuing a more assertive foreign policy. Um, it, it's no longer uh, the, the Deng Xiaoping era when China's uh, motto is uh, taking a low profile, biting your time, uh, biting your time, hiding your strength. I don't think China is hiding its strength anymore because China's strength is uh, obvious for everyone um, for everyone to see. And, and now China will leverage its strength to play a more active role in on the world stage, including uh, acting as a peacemaker. I, I think this is very positive. Is this the beginning of the end for the United States as the superpower broker in the Middle East? Uh, if it's not the beginning of the end, is it at least past the end of the beginning? Yeah, I think um, uh, this, what we see is a beginning of an end. It's a beginning of an end of U.S. hegemony in Middle East and, and also on global stage as a whole. But we shouldn't be too, uh, we shouldn't jump the gun to assume this this is it. The U U.S. Uh, hegemony is, is over. It is, I think it's far from that. Um, what we're seeing is the, in the very beginning stage of a U the declining U.S. influence um, on, the middle, on the world stage, but particularly in the Middle East. Some of the fruits of the agreement are already visible, albeit this time brokered by Russia. We now have a situation where Saudi Arabia is repairing its relations with Syria and other Gulf uh, countries are uh, openly stating that it's time for Syria to return to its Arab family, as if it was Syria that left the Arab family rather than kicked out of the family home. Um, I have to remind uh, uh, the, the listeners that the United States is still, still want to be involved and play a role in the Middle Eastern politics. That is why at this very moment, United States military is, um, is carrying out activities in Syria, you know, against Iran and its allies. This is the very reason that US decided to, to, uh, to pick a fight at this particular juncture is precisely is because they've seen it, their role has been eclipsed by China in the Middle East. So US wanted to, um, they wanted to derail the peace process that had began uh, between, between Iran and Saudi Arabia that was brokered by China. Uh, so I, I expect that US will play more a role of a spoiler. Um, you, you will try to sabotage as much as he can the, the peace process that has begun. The U.S. policy in the Middle East has been to bludgeon Iran and reward Israel. Uh, quite plainly, that has not worked, has neither broken Iran 
nor made Israel any more popular or accepted in the region or able to subjugate even the people under its control any more uh, easily. Do you think the U.S. might now begin to wake up to the fact that its politics are just not working? Yeah, exactly. Um, what you'll make it clear for for the for the world at large to see that U.S. it's is never uh, a factor for stability or peace. You know, whether in Middle East or elsewhere, and they are in fact a very uh, destabilizing element and, and you know plus right now us is talking about supplying weapons to um, azerbaijan uh, in effort to counter iran um this this runs counter to the the, the 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 wish of the people in the region who want to see more peace and stability established um i, I think um uh, people are not being fooled uh, by the rhetorics of the United States by claiming that they uh, they are the world leader and plan to play uh, a role as a peace uh, broker. Uh, that's obviously not true. And I'm heartened to see that China taking the leadership position to insert itself and to, to help to bring uh, a two very important states, Iran and Saudi Arabia together. It's very encouraging beginning, and I, I hope to see more. Robert, the, he raised the question you implicitly did about China becoming more involved on other Middle East issues. And of course, the great, the elephant sitting in the corner is, is the Israel-Palestine question. Now, China, for all its protestations of non-interference, has been a consistent supporter of Palestinian rights. That must be an additional worry for Israel. The alliance between Iran and Saudi Arabia is bad enough, but that it was brokered by an explicitly pro-Palestinian power in China as opposed to the United States must be an additional concern for them. Yes, I think Israel's very worried about this, and I think that it's worried about it for a number of reasons. Uh, I think China doesn't see Israel in the same way that Israel is seen in the Western world, this kind of myth that's been created or based on Israeli propaganda that Israel always existed. Now they're even saying that the Palestinian people do not and have never existed, for example. I don't think China sees the, the, the situation quite like that. They see it more from a normal perspective, quite frankly, which is that the Palestinian people are an oppressed people and that Israel is a Western co colonialist project in Arab and Muslim lands. So with that said, they're willing to look at it in a, in a way which perhaps the Arabs would see as more favorable to them, and then of course will help them build relationships. But the fact of the matter is that I think Israel has looked at what's happened here, and they had a plan in place of normalization with the Arabs, and Netanyahu has admitted this on camera. His policy has always been to deal with the Palestinian issue later, let's go and deal with the situation of building relations with the other Arab countries in the region, something which uh, they're now making gains on. Under Trump, they did as well. Uh, and now the situation has changed somewhat because they were hoping that Saudi Arabia might join on to this. Now, all of a sudden, they're making deals with Iran, with the Chinese, what's going to happen next? And I think that Israel, again, is very angry at the fact that they have the, uh, a, a guy in Washington, President Sleepy Joe Biden, who doesn't seem to know what day of the week it is. He's talking to people that aren't there, shaking hands with sh his shadow or something, I don't know, falling off bicycles. And the fact of the matter is, that in level of incompetence, the question around whether he's even competent enough to run a country like America, is, is affecting his allies as well. Other countries are starting to look at Joe Biden and Washington in the same way that the local press is looking at it. This is a mess. This guy is perhaps one of the worst presidents that's ever run um, from, from the White House. And I think that now Israel is really panicking about what to do going forward. What is their plan going forward? Because it looks like they're actually starting to lose some ground now. Much more of this coming up after the break. Stay tuned.
You're watching Kalim Ahora on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London with me, George Galloway. But talking about the earth-shaking significance of the recent deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and just as importantly, where it was actually struck. Dr. Abdullah, let's take stock for a minute. It isn't just the Iran-Saudi deal. It's that both Iran and Saudi Arabia are applying to join the BRICS. Both are applying to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where half of the world's wealth, more than half of the world's population is to be found. Uh, Russia has brokered uh, uh, a restoration of relations between Saudi Arabia and Syria. Uh, it is literally all change and all changing so fast we can barely keep up with it. The Israelis would be right to be bemused at the speed of events, wouldn't they? The Gulf Arabs have been resenting the fact that America has been trying to frighten them by so-called Iranian threat over decades. Uh, one of them, which I can remember, is American naval patrols uh, guarding Kuwaiti uh, oil tankers going out of the Gulf, for example, uh, to protect against Iranian aggression, so to speak. Uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries, uh, they have now come around to realize, and some of them admit it, uh, that they were pressed to buy American arms uh, to face the danger of Iranian aggression, so to speak, as well, over decades in order to help the American Treasury uh, and to uh, suck more of their money. Uh, the Arab order itself have been managed by America not only to create the divide between Iran and the Arab countries, but between Arab countries themselves and uh, with, within the minds and the hearts of many Arab leaders who may not like to admit it, they felt shackled into the American cart, so to speak. And uh, now they have been exploring uh, their freedom to deal with an alternative without offending America to the effect of endangering them. Uh, they see America as a sinking huge uh, aircraft carrier. If you come close to it as a small boat, you will sink before it sinks. But if you offend it, it still has the, pow the power to sink you. So you have to play safe and be careful not to endanger your position and manage the relationship with all parties and move outward from the American domain as much as you can because America does not want allies. China so far wants allies. So with whom do you go? The Arabs feel much safer in a, in a multipolar world where there is a balance. America does not want the balance. Uh, Madame Huda, the uh, situation, if you look at it, is a disaster for the US. They spent all this time and effort into trying to destroy Iran and all this time and effort into trying to protect, defend and build up Israel. They failed on both counts. They are now, arguably, trying to get rid of Netanyahu who for decades has been their client. Uh, but uh, they're now organizing uh, what they call civil society, the Trojan horses of NGOs and all the rest to bring Netanyahu uh, down. This is not sure-footedness. This is not likely to give people confidence in the wisdom of the American hegemon, is it? But it could give the world, the Arab world, some sense of waking up instead of con uh, destruction construct and uh, the first i mean the, the first role is to build build a country P 
Palestine, leave Palestine for a time. Palestine should do nothing till the, the Arab world unite and try to construct instead of the, the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. He wanted the 20 to 30 vision. Yes, if you want to do that, you have to construct, not destruct. You have to bring all the, the surrounding Arab world with you. And this is what he's trying to do, I think. For the US, it doesn't like it. And it will try to divide and rule policy. They destruct. China is a power in the, this period, at least, let's hope it lasts forever, mm -hmm. uh, is seeking to construct. Let's hear from an American, okay. uh, a prominent American journalist, a legend, in fact, the editor-in-chief of Consortium News, Joe Lauria, who is in Sydney, Australia. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, George. Good to see you. Joe, the U.S. officially described the deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia as a good thing, though you would have to measure the length of their faces as they said it to see how insincere that was, not least because they've spent decades trying to achieve the very opposite of what they now say is a good thing. Did they mean it? Well, they said it's a good thing, but I think they're just putting, trying to put a brave face on it. It's actually a very bad thing for the United States and Israel. Why has the U.S. been doing the opposite? Well, not since 1956 when the U.S. took over from Britain and France as the dominant Western power in the Middle East. It's been based on division, on war, on destabilizing the region and the 1979 revolution in Iran, which created this huge division between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, was mercilessly exploited by both the United States and Israel to the point where the U.S. was uh, lowering itself, not as a great power, but as a, one of the sectarian players to back uh, Sunni Arabs, in particular Saudi Arabia, against Iran. They want to create a division and to as Israel always wanted divisions in the region to, for, for their own sense of security. But the United States, in backing that, saw that destroying uh, is Iranian influence against uh, throughout the region was their principal uh, modus operandi in the Middle East. Some say that the deal could pave the way for more local, locally-led diplomatic initiatives in the resolution of conflicts. What do you think? This incredibly... Uh, uh, strong, and I call it seismic deal, that China has broken, has brokered rather, is in fact going to bring about possible resolutions of many of the most intractable and difficult troubles across the region, from Lebanon to Yemen to Syria, Iraq. Uh, and these are the really major problems throughout uh, the Middle East that, were, again, are based on troubles that were stirred up very much by, or at least promoted by the United States and Israel. So the U.S. is being marginalized by this deal. The fact that China is involved is very, very significant. It is their rival. And China is not only just brought together Iran and Saudi Arabia to restore diplomatic relations, as some analysts are trying to say that this is just a minor restoration of relations that were broken on, broken off only six years ago. China will remain engaged in this process. They've invited Iranian and Gulf uh, Arab leaders to a summit later this year in Beijing. There has now been an invitation from Saudi Arabia to the president of Iran to visit. What remains is the United States occupation in the east of Syria, which is an extremely uncomfortable position for the United States right now. So overall, this is very bad news for the United States and their interests in that region because China is bringing stability, development, and business. Is the U.S. definitely leaving the Middle East, do you think? You know, I, I've heard this for years as I covered the UN in New York for 25 years, and I would hear Middle East correspondents and diplomats from Arab countries, oh, they were worried. You know, these, of course, were pro-American diplomats in Germany. The Americans are leaving the region. They're abandoned. They never were leaving the region. They didn't abandon. They were saying that when the US invaded Iraq and inserted themselves in a way they never had before. I don't think the US is leaving so much as they're being marginalized. They're being sidelined by this. I think the one remaining, one of them remaining, uh, besides their relationship with Israel, which is not going to be broken anytime soon, is their arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Now, China is, if China ever makes significant arms sales 
to Saudi Arabia, then the game is really up for the United States. Right now, Saudi Arabia is trying to maintain good relations with the U.S., which knows very well that Saudi Arabia has talked about maybe joining the BRICS, which, of course, would bring them even closer to Russia and China, that they've discussed possible uh, a Petro One replacing a Petro Dollars is way down the road. But this makes people in the Beltway very nervous and maybe giving them sleepless nights. When they hear that Saudi Arabia is is cozying up to China and Russia, the two night now mortal enemy powers of the United States, so the U.S. is going to try to stay engaged. But how can they push their their violent interventions in the Middle East when the leaders on both sides of this divide are now being uh, are coming together, trying to resolve their differences in the name of Chinese and Russian diplomacy to bring about the development and peace in the region. How can the U.S. now push the same old policies? It's going to be very, very difficult for them. So uh, they, they're, they're confused right now. They've got to reassess in, in the Pentagon and the State Department at the White House what exactly the whole U.S. role in the Middle East will be as we see the confrontational approach by the U.S. towards Iran has now clearly failed. It lies in ruins. It's discredited amongst America's European allies. It's discredited now amongst its very closest Arab allies. Do you think they're going to recalibrate their approach to Iran, or will they double down with Israel's uh, ire as their only ally on it? That's going to be a long process, a very long process in Washington, in my view. Uh, eventually, they, we would hope that they would come around to that opinion, to that understanding. But that also goes into the U.S. role in the entire world. This is just a microcosm of their their role around the world. Is the U.S. the dominant unipolar uh, primacy uh, power in the world that the U.S. Uh, can dictate? to other countries what to do? Are they starting to realize that the world is changing now and it's been accelerated vastly by the war in Ukraine, uh, where the rest of the world is not lined up with the US and the West in terms of sanctions against Russia? They've mostly taken a neutral position. And uh, this is really worrying people in 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 the halls of power in Washington. Uh, but you start to see some articles in foreign policy and some of these other more or less highbrow American foreign policy magazines that they, uh, they're beginning to understand this, that this is not the same old world of U.S. primacy, uh, and the Middle East is a big part of that, that the world is changing. The U.S. will eventually have to adjust to that. Of course, what many people fear is that that uh, hotheads will prevail in Washington, and rather than give up that dominant position, that they might escalate even further the war in Ukraine and cause a possible uh, great power conflict, not only between Russia and NATO, but also with China and uh, the West were dragging Australia along with them. So these are very, very dramatic times, George, that we're living extremely. Given the nuclear weapons involved, maybe the most dramatic period in human history, because what's at stake here? So the US eventually, we would hope, will readjust their position in the world as a member of the international community, not the member of the international community that bosses everyone else around. Robert, uh, sketch for us the changes that may now happen on the ground. Nothing is guaranteed. Anything could disrupt. But if this process goes forward, what does it mean for the Arabs, at least from the Levant to the Gulf? Well, obviously, there's, uh, there's already moves being made regarding um, rebuilding ties with Syria, for example. So we could see Syria being welcomed back into the fold of, uh, of the Arab world politically. Uh, and that's already beginning to happen. And again, other countries like Lebanon, Iraq, could they see a positive change as a result of positive uh, talks taking place between the Saudis and the Iranians? Because uh, normally the, the, the crux of the problems in those countries, political or military or whatever else, uh, tends to get pinned locally at least on the Cold War situation between Iran and Saudi Arabia. But obviously, I think it's naive of us to assume that America is gonna take this sitting down the idea that China or Russia or anyone else is going to steamroll into the region and nudge the Americans out, the Israelis certainly won't like that. But hopefully in the short term and the long term, there will be some positive results of this, a move away from conflict towards dialogue, diplomacy and, um, and resolution uh, building. And Dr. Abdullah, what about the Palestinians? Can they see any light at the end of the tunnel as a result of this? 
in the short term, I think they will continue to suffer because of the right-wing government in Israel and the inability of Arab countries <coughs> to do something effective to end their misery. Yes, it, it will be to the benefit of the Palestinians, but uh, as Robert said, it will take time to materialize. America will not take it lying down. America still has influence, has its own people in key positions in the Middle East. In addition to those who are undercover all over the place, you don't know where the octopus reaches. Uh, so I expect some serious attempts to tear this agreement uh, before it materializes. Uh, but I think it is in the interest of all Arab countries in the Middle East and probably countries in the margin, uh, like Turkey as well, it is in their interest that this agreement succeeds in order to put an end to uh, the American century. Yes, before it even really before. properly got started. Yes. Madame Huda, I mentioned earlier that Netanyahu seems to be in danger now of being overthrown. Uh, I believe it's not universally agreed that the Americans are behind this and that they are moving the, the middle class Israelis on the streets. But whether I'm right or I'm wrong, there's instability in Israel now and it's not clear what, how the chips will fall there in the end. But what about Saudi Arabia? If uh, the crown prince is the man driving these changes and it's difficult to conclude otherwise, might his position be in danger? Are there parts of the octopus that Dr. Abdullah talks about uh, that might uh, seek to stretch out their many limbs and uh, topple him? We never know. Politics is uh, unpredictable. But I think the Crown Prince is very careful to present himself as a person who has a vision and I think the, the, the people, the Saudis, are behind him, especially the young ones. And these changes are not easy. So, What about the Iranian leadership? How secure are they in this? Is there unanimity in Iran about this peace deal? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the Iranians have actually, uh, despite what you see in Western headlines and so on and so forth, over the past number of years, the Iranians have said the same thing. Bottom line, they're willing to work with the Saudis. They're willing to engage in them, with them positively. They believe that dialogue is better than uh, the, the Cold War situation that we've had or conflict. And the Iranians have never actually advocated for total all-out war in the region. This is just something that you see in Western headlines. The Iranians, I mean, I've even heard Mohammad Javad Zarif, the former foreign minister, say this on numerous occasions, that we're ready to open dialogue with the Saudis again, but they need to come and meet us halfway, which until now they haven't been willing to do. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that I think the Iranians are happy with this uh, position. They're very happy that it's coming from the East rather than the West because they just do not trust the West at all, especially with the breakdown of the JCPOA, uh, Iran nuclear arrangement and the, the, the backstabbing behavior of the US in that regard. Uh, so I think trust is completely broken down there. But of course, Iran and Saudi Arabia still have major areas of dispute, which is, which is not going to be resolved overnight. But the fact of the matter is that both sides, I think, are now taking a, a pragmatic position that they have major disagreements that need resolving. They both want them resolved one way or another, and they're only going to do it if they negotiate face to face because they can't. Re the Saudis can't rely on America, and Iran is not going to work with America ever, as far as I can see, uh, with the way things are going. So ultimately, I think the Iranians see this as a positive development, but uh, the Iranians uh, have, have always taken that position. So it's actually quite surprising, I think, for, for many in Iran when they're accused of being just a, a, a rogue aggressor that constantly wants to do nothing but cause warfare and everything else. These are myths that the West peddles and it's propaganda. Doctor, last word to you. Uh, what does this mean for the so-called Abraham Accords? 
It's a little bit embarrassing now. They made them with Trump. Uh, they made them with uh, Trump's uh, son-in-law. Uh, the deal of the century turned out to be, <laughs> well, uh, not a deal you'd want to yourself have made. Uh, and what does it mean for this JCPOA? I mean, for how long are you going to have Europeans accepting the disruption to the Iran nuclear deal? Or is that now over? Uh, is Iran going to produce a nuclear bomb? First, with regard to the Abrahamic uh, fiction, uh, it is unacceptable almost in every Arab country except within a few uh, in the Gulf. Uh, but generally speaking, all over the Middle East, uh, there has been a total rejection of this. It's not popular by no, people. No, no, it's not popular at all. With regard to uh, the Europeans uh, and, the, the nuclear deal. And, and the nuclear deal, I think the, Ameri the Europeans don't want to wake up to the fact that America uses them rather than consider them as a party to an alliance of win-win within the alliance. When the Europeans will wake up, this is a big question which some other people may be better to answer than me. Rip Van Winkle, thank you very much indeed for your expertise. Dear viewers, there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. It is our good fortune to be living in those weeks. We have only scratched the surface of the new landscape produced by the historic agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran under the chairmanship of China. The deal between Russia, brokered between Russia, Saudi Arabia and Syria, may very well bring an end to well over a decade of agony for the people of Syria. This must have a positive knock-on effect in Lebanon. Myself, I know I am often accused of being an optimist. It's in my nature. I have been with the Arabs in the Arab world for half a century. I've never been as optimistic as this. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kali Mahora. And you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you for tuning in.